uh, hello, Itamar. Uh, Itamar. Itamar Turner Traurig is a, a trainer and software developer and writes at, about Python at pythonspeed.com. And you've been doing Python for over 20 years. Is that true? Yeah, since 1999. That's amazing. And you, you still enjoy it a lot. I do, yes. Uh, Today, you, you plan to uh, show us something about Docker. Yeah, uh, it's sort of in the process that uh, I use for Docker packaging to make it ready for production because there's a lot of details. It's complicated enough. You need a whole process for it. Okay, let's see if your screen share works and then I'd say uh, we should start your talk. Uh, so yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, production ready Docker packaging for Python. And again, my name is Itamar. And the first thing uh, you need to understand is that Docker packaging is really complicated. There's a lot of details you need to get right. And the reason is, is that it builds on a whole, on basically 50 years of technology uh, from Unix in the 70s to Docker and modern, modern Python packaging in the 2010s. I don't really want to talk about the 2020s. Um, and so each of these technologies which accumulated over the years has its own uh, assumptions about how things work, uh, its own uh, design mistakes, like however useful these technologies are and they're not perfect. Uh, they all have certain defaults, which may or may not be correct in the case of running within Docker. Uh, and so the accumulation of all these uh, technologies sort of intersects within the Docker packaging for your Python application. And so you just end up having to get a lot of details right in order to make something that's truly production ready. And so this is not simple. And so the result is that there's basically, I cannot, uh, cover all this material in one half hour talk. Um, so we only have 30 minutes, um, that includes questions. Uh, I have my own personal list of Docker packaging best practices, has at least 60 items on it and it keeps growing. Uh, when I teach this as a training class, uh, these days I would do it like a day and a half because just there's so much material and even then I don't, can't quite cover all the details, uh, but can do it in, at least in, in some depth. And so within a talk we can't, actually learn all the best practices. But what we can do is learn, uh, go over a process for how you do this packaging. And the reason you need a process is in part just because of this complexity. Like there's a lot of details. Um, there's a lot of things that are easy to miss. Uh, it's easy to get uh, sidetracked by certain aspects of the problem like, oh, my image is huge and then forget about other aspects like security. But also because Docker packaging is probably a thing you're going to be doing on your job. Uh, and you know, if you're working in a job, there's usually lots of other things that you need to be doing. Um, there might be some critical bug that interrupts you, you have to go to a meeting. And so this isn't the sort of thing where you spend half an hour, uh, finish it and it's done and it's perfect. Uh, you're gonna have to put a little bit more time into it. And so what you need is a process, a process that will help you do iterative development so, so that you can stop at any point and come back later. Um, that helps you focus on doing the important parts first and reminds you what the important parts are. And that builds, so each step builds on the, next, on the previous one so that uh, you sort of have this cycle of continuous improvement. So I'm gonna go through this process and the steps in the process. And for each step, I'm gonna give a example of one of the best practices uh, and list a few more. Because I don't have the time to actually go through all of them, what I'm gonna do is at the end of the talk, uh, there'll be a link to my, the free guide I have on my website. It's at least 30 articles, and it covers a lot of these best practices in far more detail. Um, and so you don't have to like try to, you know, remember all of this. Like uh, th there will be a link to the slides and a link to much more detailed uh, guide which, for those best practices that I don't cover at least most of them. So here's an overview of the process. Uh, and this is what's going to structure the rest of the talk. Um, we start out with getting something working and then move on to security. And eventually um, the last thing you do is you, you optimize your image uh, so you can build faster and make it smaller. Uh, and the idea here is you want to start with the most important parts um, like Security is fairly critical in most applications. You probably want to do it first. Having a small image is 
a thing you want to do, we're probably like not immediately. It's lower on the priority list. This is sort of a generic list. Um, and in your particular application, in your situation, the order might be different. Uh, so this is a starting point. Uh, maybe that reproducible builds, for example, are early critical for what you're doing. And so you might uh, do them first. Um, and this is also a process that uh, sort of guides you the first two or three times that you're doing that. And eventually, like you'll be doing a lot of these press practices automatically. Uh, and so you won't need to think so much in terms of this exact order. Like you might just automatically do a whole bunch of step four right, right from the beginning. Uh, but even then, it's useful to have sort of a checklist of here's all the things I have to do because there are so many details to get right. So the first step uh, in packaging your Docker image is just getting something working. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your packaging is, how secure and efficient and small and correct, it doesn't actually run your application, like right? doesn't run your server. This is sort of the bare minimum to have said you've succeeded at doing something useful. And so the first step is just pack, get your application working, even if it's done in a sort of, in, in not an ideal way because it's just your starting point. Uh, so this example Docker file, um, I'm using the Python 3.8 Slim Buster Docker image as a base image, copying in all the files from the current directory, running pip install to install the code. And then I use the entry point to say, uh, when you run this image, um, run this script uh, to start up the container. Uh, so it's not a, as you'll see, even from the examples, this has a bunch of flaws, but it's a starting point, like, and you have to start somewhere. And the next step is security. Um, before you can feel comfortable deploying something publicly where anyone on the internet can access it, uh, you probably should be making sure that that application is as secure as you can make it. Um, Otherwise, you basically always have this worry that someone will break into it, get access to your private data, modify your website, uh, take it down. Uh, and so since security is sort of a sort of minimal prerequisite for running anything, for deploying anything, um, it's probably the, the, a good first step in, in terms of what best practices you should implement. So again, I won't, can't cover all security best practices, but for each of these steps, I'm going to give an example. Uh, and for security, uh, one best practice is don't run as root. Um, containers are a way to isolate uh, processes from each other and from uh, the host uh, operating system, but they're only uh, isolated in a limited way. A virtual machine is much more isolated. Uh, and so the when you run a Docker image and create a container by default, most Docker images will run as a root. As root. Uh, so if you run um, Nginx, it'll run as root, run the official Python image, run as root, run the Ubuntu image, it'll run as root. And the problem with running as root is that it gives uh, rather more access than one would like uh, to various capabilities of the operating system. And so if someone manages to take over your process remotely, if your process is running as root, even in a container, it is much easier for an attacker to uh, escape the container and escalate their access and take over your whole computer. And so good security risk practices don't run as root. And so in this example, I've updated the Docker file so that uh, after choosing the base image, we run a command that creates a new user called app user. And then we use a Docker file user command to say all later commands should run as this new user. So for example, when you copy in files, they'll now be owned by this new user. When you run pip install, it'll run as that user. Uh, when you start up the container, uh, it will run the container as this non-root user. And so with you know, two or three extra lines of uh, code in your Docker file, you're now having a much more secure Docker image. Again, there's plenty of other security best practices. I won't go into them, but the guide I'll link to at the end has more details about many of them. So now that you have a working image uh, that is hopefully somewhat secure, uh, you might just start thinking about automation. Uh, this up to this point, you just you have this backup file, you build it manually. You could deploy it manually if you want. Uh, but 
you know, over time, you don't want to have to rebuild your application every time someone um, merges a pull request. You might have uh, other team members who are using this code base and they want things to be built automatically. They don't, want, they don't care about the details. And so a good next step is to automate the builds so that your builder CI system automatically builds Docker images and pushes them to the image registry, the server that stores your Docker images. So here's a sample bash script that does that for you. Um, uh, do set minus e uo pipe fail, which is a line you should have at every, every bash script just so it stops running when there's errors. Uh, we run our tests, uh, do Docker build to build the image, and then do Docker push to push your image. So if you put this in your build no CI system, uh, every time uh, you trigger a build, it'll also build and push your Docker image. And so once you start doing this, uh, you have to start thinking about the way that you structure development uh, and the way your development process uh, integrates with your build system. So for example, a common uh, development process is to have feature branches. So if you have an issue 123, then the developer working on that issue will create a branch 123 uh, and do the work in that uh, add the feature, fix the bug in that branch, and then do a pull request. And then your build system will automatically build, uh, run the tests and do a build in the, from that pull request. And you might want to build a Docker image um, for every pull request because you might want to test that Docker image uh, manually or automatically, maybe have an integration test. And if you use the scripts that uh, showed in the last slide, which is, very, which is fairly simplistic, what's going to happen is you have this pull request to the branch, and then you're going to build that image, and then you're going to push it, and it's going to overwrite your stable release Docker image, because you're always giving the images you push the same name. Like you're always pu pushing to your image latest, which means random pull requests are going to overwrite your official release Docker image. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that Docker images built by pull requests don't stomp on your released Docker image. And one easy way to do this is to name your images based on your Git branch. Uh, so in this variant of the build script, uh, I'm getting the current Git branch using the git rev parse command. Uh, just for the record, I don't, I don't remember the Git commands ever. I always use stack overflow or uh, look at a at my notes because they're impossible to remember. Um, so you get the git branch, and then you say, I'm going to name this man such, the, such that the, I'm going to name my Im new image such that the part after the colon, the tag, is the same as the git branch. And so if you have uh, branch one, two, three, more cowbell, now this image will be your image colon one, two, three, more cowbell, and it won't overwrite your uh, production image, your stable image. Again, plenty of other best practices that you can do in your CI system, uh, which we won't go into today. So at this point, you have an image that runs your application. Um, it is hopefully secure, and it has automated builds. And so now that you have automated builds, you're starting to accumulate multiple images. Uh, you have your image you built last week, your image you built today, the image from a pull request, uh, image your team I created. Um, you're running it. Uh, in production, maybe. Um, people are running different versions of it. And so now you're more likely to see errors. You're more likely to have to try to debug errors. Um, so a good next step at this point is to work on making your Docker image easier to identify and also easier to debug. And so here's an example best practice for making your Docker image or even your Python code in general more debuggable. So if you have a bug in your Python code, uh, something went wrong, bad input, uh, unexpected issue somewhere, you'll get an exception thrown. If it's something that can't get handled, then what will usually happen is it'll get converted to a traceback. The traceback will be stored in the logs. And then if your server crashes, you can go look in the logs. Uh, if it doesn't crash and you have a bug report, you can go look in the logs. You look in the logs and you say, oh, it was this function calling this function, this line of code through a zero, through a zero division error. And that gives you a really good starting point for figuring out what went wrong. Because you know where in your code this error originated from. If you have a bug in C code, that's not what's going to happen. If you have a bug in C code, your program is going to crash silently. Uh, and the Python interpreter is written in C. And chances are many of the third-party uh, extensions you're installing 
also using C code, whether it's a database adapter or, or MATLAB or NumPy. Um, most projects will end up using some C code. And so if you have a crash in your C code, you might get a core dump, but the file system for your Docker container is ephemeral and typically will just get thrown away once your process crashes. So your process crashes, may core dump may not, and then the file system disappears and then now you have nothing. You have no logs, no core dump, all you know is that your program crashed. Uh, and so it's extremely difficult to debug code in this situation. Luckily, Python has a solution for this. There's a module called Fault Handler. And what it does is it adds some hooks so that if your program crashes in C code, it will do a best effort to print a traceback of the Python code uh, where you crashed. What that means is crashes in C code give you the same information that crashes in Python code do, a nice Python traceback, which allows you to sort of figure out where in your code the, came, the bug came from, or you can say, oh, this came out of a database adapter. There's a bug in a database adapter. Uh, instead of just no, having no idea where the problem came from. And the easiest way to use fault handler is to set a environment handler, uh, an environment variable called Python fault handler. So you set it to one, you can do this uh, in your shell for local for running code locally. You can, in your Docker file, you can use the env command. So you do env Python fault handler equals one. It's one extra line in your Docker, fi Docker file. And from now on, anytime you have a crash in your C code, you'll have a much easier time debugging it. Again, uh, there are other best practices you can use to make your image easier to identify and easier to debug. So now on to step five. So you have a working uh, container. It runs your application. It's secure. Uh, gets built automatically. Uh, you made it easier to identify and debug. And so the next step is to say, well, how can we uh, make it run better, run faster, uh, have, be less likely to have issues in the first place? Uh, and so that means things like making it start up faster, uh, which can in certain applications uh, make a big difference, uh, shut down uh, faster, which can, if you're like deploying new versions of your code, you like fast shutdown makes it easier to deploy a bug fix, uh, allow your runtime environment to detect if your process is frozen, that sort of thing. And so one example of a best practice for operational correctness is uh, compiling your bytecode. Uh, so when your Python interpreter runs your source code, it doesn't actually run the Python source code, the text that you wrote in the, that PY file. What actually happens is it parses the source code and then creates bytecode, uh, which is what the interpreter in the CPython virtual machine runs. Uh, interpreter virtual machine. Um, and so, and then it takes that bytecode and it writes it to a .puic file and stores it on disk. And the next time we run your Python application, instead of having to parse the source code and convert it to PYC, it can load the PYC directly. That can speed up your startup. If you're, so if your Docker image doesn't have PYCs for all of your source code, that will mean slower startup because every time you start the container, it's gonna have to parse the source code. And on your, when you're running on your local computer, this is not really a thing you think about because your file system is persistent. So you run a program once, creates the PYCs, and you run the program a second time and the PYCs are there and um, they can get used and your startup is faster. When you're running in a Docker image, every time when you're starting a container from a Docker image, every time you start a new container, it starts from a pristine copy of whatever was in the Docker image file system. And so every time you start a new container, if there's new node.pycs, it'll create them. And then when the process exits and the container exits, that file system will get thrown away. And the next time you start the container, it'll again start without that PYCs. And so if you're packaging something for Docker, you may have to explicitly create those .pyc files and have faster start. And there's a couple of line, example lines here you can add to your Docker file. One of them uh, compiles, um, the code that you've installed and typically pip does this so you, you may not have to do this uh, most of the time. But if you just copy some code into a directory and you're just running it from there, uh, pip doesn't know it exists, pip didn't compile it and so you will have to compile it yourself. And so you can use the uh, compile all module that comes with Python to compile the code to a bytecode uh, as part of your Docker packaging and then start up will be faster. And again, there's plenty of other best practices uh, from signal handling uh, to shutdown to health checks. Uh, if you want to learn about uh, signal handling for shutdowns, um, Hinnick uh, 
uh, Schwalk, just pronounce his name. Um, Hennig has a nice article about this. And so at this point, uh, you have a Docker image that is correct in terms of how it runs, but not necessarily correct in uh, how you build it. And so, you know, if it's been like, you know, you spent the past day or two among other things, you know, fixing bugs in your code and going to meetings, but also doing Docker packaging. Over the course of two days, uh, the things you depend on, like the Linux distribution you're using for your base image, um, you know, version of Python, Django, NumPy, whatever libraries you use, there's probably not going to be a major release. And so if you're saying, uh, just install the latest version of everything, that's fine. Like if you do it today and do it yes, if you did it yesterday, like you'll get the same image more or less, most of the time at least. Six months from now, if you try to rebuild an image that installs the latest version of everything, some of those dependencies will have changed. If you try to rebuild it two years later, all of them will have changed. And so the problem here is uh, if you're always installing the latest version of the code, you can rebuild, you, you might go back to something that hasn't changed in six months. You just want to do a minor bug fix and you rebuild the image and suddenly three major dependencies have changed and you've broken everything, even though all you want to do is a major bug fix. So over time, once you, you have a Docker file that you're going to be using over time, you want to make sure that it's reproducible. Uh, you want to make sure that you're installing specific versions of specific packages, specific Linux distribution, so when you rebuild the image, you'll get the exact same image. Which isn't to say you shouldn't be doing updates. You should, but you should be doing those in a controlled manner, not as a side effect of doing a minor bug fix. So one example of the ways you should make your image reproducible is by choosing a good base image. Uh, so Docker images are typically based on some other Docker image. You use the from command at the beginning to say, use this as my base image. And typically they're based on some Linux distribution. And so you want a Linux distribution that will guarantee things like security updates, uh, but also guarantee stability for some period of time. So like two, three years of uh, guaranteeing bug fixes while not changing uh, ABIs, major version libraries, that sort of thing. Like just that you want the Linux distribution to be stable, not change out from under you unexpectedly. And so Ubuntu long-term support, Debian stable, or CentOS are all Linux distributions that make the guarantee. The official Python Docker images um, are based on Debian stable uh, by default, but they also give you access to different versions of Python, not just the versions that Debian stable happens to have. So when Python 3.9 comes out, Debian stable won't have it, but the official Python image will just take Debian stable and add Python 3.9 to it. Uh, so I like using the official Python images. Uh, so for example, Python 3.8 Slim Buster is Python 3.8, the latest point release. So 3.8.4, if that's the latest release, 3.8.5, if that's the latest point release. Uh, on Debian Buster, which is the latest version of Debian stable, um, slim means a smaller version because there's like a smaller version, the bigger version, and the bigger version just takes more disk space, but it has more debugging utilities. Um, like, um, and if you use a stable base image, you'll have more reproducible builds. Again, lots of other things you need to do like pinning your Python packages. So once you have reproducible builds, your builds are correct, your runtime is correct, in some sense you're done. Uh, but at that point you might want to start uh, thinking about some optimizations. It's correct, but you might be able to make things more efficient. A good starting point is faster builds because your time is expensive. And if every time you do a build, it takes 30 minutes to build your Docker image, uh, you can't see if your tests are passing until that build passes, it's just slowing you down, wasting your time, wasting your teammates time. Um, so it's worth spending some time optimizing build times. And one best practice for making faster builds is avoid using Alpine Linux. Alpine Linux is a Linux distribution and it's a very small Linux distribution, uh, makes for smaller images. And so it's often recommended as a base image for Docker images. If you're a Go programmer, it's a fine advice. Uh, if you're a Python programmer, you should not use it as your base image. The issue is that uh, when you're, if you're a uh, pack package maintainer who uploads packages to PyPI, you can upload pre-compiled binaries like for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, and then someone who downloads that uh, binary doesn't have to compile the C code in the package. Like lots of Python packages, you have lots of C code. And so not having to compile the packages saves lots of time installing them. Alpine cannot use binary wheels from PyPI these days at least. That might change in the future. 
Uh, so just to compare, if you install pandas in Matplotlib on my computer, if you use the Debian-based official image, Python 3.8 Slim Buster, installs in 30 seconds, it just downloads it, unpacks it, it's done. If you're using the Alpine variant, it takes 1,500 seconds. It's 50 times slower because it has to compile a whole pile of C code, it has to install a compiler, a compiler tool chain. It's just much, much slower. So if you want fast builds, don't use Alpine Linux. Again, plenty of other best practices. The final step is making your image smaller. Um, having a two gigabyte images wastes bandwidth, wastes time, um, uh, might be worth optimizing that part. And one example of best practice out of many is typically when uh, pip, you pip install something, let's say you pip install uh, pandas or Django, it downloads the Django package, unzips it or untars it, and then keeps that package around so that if you pip install later, you won't have to download it again. In a Docker image, you're never going to run pip install again. So keeping this extra copy of the package around just waste space. So if you add the no cache there option to pip install, you'll end up with a small Docker image and then uh, with no harm done because you're never going to run pip install again. And again, plenty of other best practices. So to recap, we start getting something working, make it secure, make it automated, make things easy to identify and debug and easier and run better, make builds reproducible, and then optimize with faster builds and smaller images. And the goal here is to have some good stopping points. So if you do security first, if you stop it right after doing security, at least you have a secure image. If you mix up security and make our images smaller, you might have a half secure image, which isn't ideal if you're forced to stop. And again, your particular application environment might result in different priorities. So this is just a suggested starting point for how you should, the order in which you should work on your Docker image. Your application might be different, but this is, I think is a reasonable starting point and a reasonable way to remember all the different things that go into it. So thanks for coming to my talk. Um, as I said, many of these best practices are covered in great detail on a free guide on my website. Um, and there's links to that guide and other resources for Python Docker packaging as well, these, as well as these slides at pythonspeed.com slash europython2020. These are my email, email and Twitter account. Um, if you have any questions, I believe there's a talk channel in uh, Discord uh, for this talk, uh, hash talk dash docker dash packaging. And we might have time for a question or two. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk first. And there's a few questions. And the first one is, can you give an example for install dependencies separately from your code as in your best practice? Yes, so the way um, Docker packaging works is uh, install things in layers. Uh, so each line in your Docker file to first approximation is a layer. And Docker has uh, this caching system where when you rebuild an image, you'll say, if this layer hasn't changed, I don't have to rebuild it. Uh, and the way it decides if it's changed is based on um, either the text of the command or the files that you copied in. And so if you install both your code and your dependencies together, that means you have to copy in everything and then install your dependencies and you know, pandas and Netflix and Django and Flask and what have you, and your code at the same time. And so if you change your source code, that's going to invalidate the cache and you're gonna to have to rebuild, you're gonna to have to reinstall all your dependencies. So even though like you're still installing the exact same packages, you're still installing the exact same ver version of Django and the exact same version of your Postgres adapter and so on, you're still gonna to have to um, you can't use the cache. You're gonna to have to redo that from scratch. If however, instead of copying all the files in and installing things uh, together, you first copy in requirements.txt and then do run pip install minus r requirements.txt, then the caching layer um, can say, oh, requirements.txt hasn't changed, so I can just reuse this uh, layer and then your build will be faster because you won't have to reinstall those packages every time your source code changes. Only you have to reinstall those packages on requirements that text changes. Okay, there's a question about the compile all uh, idea. How does Python minus M compile all interact with Python code that uses the uh, Dunder main pi? Uh, uh, that's from Goose. He says, we often have tools like run like Python minus M my tool arguments. 
So how would that compile all work there? Uh, I believe compile, and I could be wrong, but my understanding of how compile all works is it just finds all that .py files, parses them, and writes out the bytecode. So it's not running them, it's just parsing them. So it's just, it's just a file system operation. It just finds all .py files. Um, so it doesn't matter how you run the code, it just matters what files you have in the file system. If you've pip installed your code, you typically don't need it because pip will, by default, compile things for you. Okay, so thank you. you. There's a final question. Uh, what kind of security testing would you recommend for Docker images? Any good tools, packages? Uh, there's a bunch of uh, security scanners. Uh, there's Bandit, which is a security scanner for source code, uh, for Python source code. So we'll find things like uh, SQL injections and use of pickle. Uh, there's a uh, tool called, a uh, command line tool called Safety that will scan for uh, insecure Python dependencies, uh, although you have to pay them uh, if you want more than, like it's a commercial tool, so the, by default you only get the up to one month, last month of updates. Uh, the updates can be as much as a month out of date, uh, so you have to pay them if you want more timely security updates. And there's a tool called Trivy, T-R-I-V-Y, which will do scans on your system packages Again, if you go to my uh, website, uh, to the area about Docker packaging, I have an um, article about um, security scanners for Docker packages. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so at this point, uh, it was very useful and we have to thank you for all these tips that we can use in our real life. So here's a round of virtual applause for you. And uh, I hope you're going to find people abroad in the uh, Discord talk channel as well.